And if you can't leave well enough alone, what's to stop you from spreading in one direction and then dragging it back in the other direction? That's roughly even, but now the cards are doubled up, which means that you could press down on this side and just lift the whole thing up like it's a wall. <sighs> hey, YouTube. So there's kind of a running joke about the magic that I do on Instagram, all of the lapping and the spreads and the gambling and shuffling stuff. And it goes something like that if I ever had to stand up, all of my magic powers would go away which would honestly be a lot more hurtful if it wasn't so very close to the truth. There's probably a couple of you out there that already know the reason about why I mainly stay at the card table. But just in case you haven't heard the story, ever since I was a kid, I've had a soft tremor in both hands. It's not really a big deal, not really a medical thing. It's more just an inconvenience. And as long as I'm in motion, it doesn't really crop up. But things tend to get a little less predictable if I ever have to slow down or do fine motor work at my fingertips which broadly describes the entirety of advanced card magic. Incidentally, it's also one of the reasons why for years I avoided cardistry like it was sushi at a gas station. My life just wasn't built for that kind of uncertainty. Now, to be clear, I'm not telling you any of this to try to garner any sympathy. In fact, it's the other way around. What I'm telling you is that if you're a card magician who happens to have shaky hands, you could actually do really well for yourself on social media if you just move to the card table. Because here's the thing, take these shaky bad boys and put them on the table and they don't shake anymore. Which means now I can move as fast or as slow, as big or as small as I want because I have an entire surface stabilizing me. But the table also does one other very important thing. It holds all of the cards for me. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like having an assistant on stage with you ready to help with whatever you need, whether that be space, because what you need to do requires a lot of real estate, or it might be tempo, because you can pause, you can let go, you can interact and then pick up wherever you left off, or it might even be execution, because there are just some moves that are very difficult, if not completely impossible to do, if all you have to work with is a couple of shaky mitts. Now, none of those factors mean that you have to move to the card table in order to do beautiful card magic. It's like any other tool, you could use it or not. And if you don't have shaky hands, then pff, go nuts, do whatever you want. But the table is uniquely gifted at helping you to explore one other factor that doesn't really get brought up a lot. And that factor is style. So in order to help you explore that particular factor, eyebrows not included, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a ribbon spread at the table. And then I'll show you just a couple of things that you could do in order to add a bit of flair to that bad boy. And then we'll end by going over a couple of resources from people who took the ribbon spread beyond a flourish into something useful, maybe even something magical. One of the major reasons why a ribbon spread can be so cool and so impressive is because it's outside of the context of the way people normally handle a deck of cards. You might have family members that can do the fancy in the hands riffle shuffle where they bridge the cards, and that's very impressive. But even that tends to fall within the context of the home games that they play. A ribbon spread, on the other hand, doesn't fit very easily into any of those categories because there are no games that require you to learn to spread the cards perfectly evenly. And really, there's only two ways to show off. You can either do something that everyone else does better than everyone else does it, or you can do something really cool that no one else does. And the ribbon spread is more along those lines. Okay, so the first thing that you need is a flat, stable surface with just a little bit of friction. You'll see why that's important here in just a second. If you don't have access to a close-up pad, not a big deal. Just start where I did. Find a sturdy couch cushion and use the top of that. Or wrap a bath towel around a really big book. Or even use the matted down part of the carpet in your house. Just try to avoid using perfectly smooth surfaces like wood or glass. Because even though card spreads look beautiful on them, when you go to do anything with those card spreads, it'll feel a lot like you're ice skating uphill. And the next thing you'll need, for obvious reasons, is a brand new deck of cards, or as new as you can possibly make it. Old decks tend to clump up when you go to spread them, and it can make it very difficult to learn how to do this well when you're first starting out. Eventually that goes away, you won't care, but for now, the newer the better. For demo purposes, I'm gonna use the chapter one deck. Shout out to Emily Slights 52 I'll put a link in the description below. She creates beautiful decks, and this is her latest book theme deck. It's got a cool calligraphy design on the back. It's gonna look really pretty when we do this stuff. A brand new deck of cards generally has the least amount of friction that you're going to find, and it creates a uniformity of motion when those cards go to spread along a surface, even if that surface is each other. It's why moves like that work. But counterintuitively, when you go do a ribbon spread, the surface you're working with, you want to have just a little bit of friction to help control the spread of the cards, and also to hold them in place when you go to do something with that ribbon spread after you're done making it look so pretty. And this is what I mean by having very little friction. If I were to take the cards and just lightly toss them, you'd notice that they actually spread pretty evenly. 
And that happens because one card hits the table and then the card on top of it slides until it falls off the edge and hits the table. And that continues all the way down the line. And it's pretty even just by default. Cool part is you can hold the deck however you want and that's basically still true. But if you don't wanna leave your card spread to fake chance and circumstance, there is a more controlled way to do this. I'll show you how to do this with the short ends of the deck, but once you learn the basics of it, you'll realize that you don't really have to care about how you hold the deck because you'll have the basic principles of pressure and friction. So hold the deck with the pinky at one corner, ring finger somewhere in the middle, middle finger sitting on the opposite corner, thumb is just off the dead center mark, and then you're going to bevel the deck. You're going to slant it just a bit and rest your first finger on that edge. And that bevel helps you get contact with all of the cards as evenly as possible. Eventually you won't need the first finger, but for right now, when you're first starting out, it's a great way to control the amount of the spread as you pull the deck from one side to another. Then you set the deck down and you apply a bit of downward pressure to the top of the deck, either by setting your hand on top of the deck like this and pressing down, or you can use the edge of the top card and the insides of your fingers to apply a bit of pressure. Now, your first finger, when pressed down very hard, causes the cards to separate a great deal whenever you're pulling the deck from one side to another. But if you lighten the pressure, they separate a bit less. And if you lighten the pressure to almost nothing, they barely separate at all. So your goal is to practice this enough until you get the feel for how hard you have to press with your first finger's tip to get the cards to separate to whatever you need. Eventually you get the feel for it and you get an almost even spread all the way across. But that does take practice. The only way to do this well is to practice it. Once you get this though, now all bets are off. Now you can do whatever it is that you want. And the first thing that people learn how to do is the turnover. This turnover is the easiest return on the investment of trying to get a nice even card spread because the fact that they're even allows each card to turn the successive card over with it without separating. The way that you do this is by pressing lightly down on this part of the spread. And then all you have to do is lightly hinge that first card up. You don't wanna scoop up the spread because that's going to clump the cards together. So you press down lightly, get your finger underneath, and you allow it to just rest against the table. And because there's a bit of friction at the table right here, that keeps the cards from sliding away from each other when you do this. It's also one of the reasons why this is so difficult to do on a nice smooth surface like wood or glass. Now the only thing that you have to do is literally just drag your fingers along, pressing down very, very lightly and allowing those cards to turn over until you get to the other end. You can do this over and over and over again as long as you don't press down. If you press down too hard, those cards start to separate from each other and clump up and you lose your spread eventually. But if you press down lightly, you could do this over and over and over again, and it keeps the cards in place. And you can keep passing back and forth. Eventually you can learn to get fancy with the spices and use two hands, stop in the middle and separate them. You eventually don't have to use your finger to do that. You can just control that turnover by applying pressure to this first card, pressing down and then applying a bit of pressure on this side over here to keep the spread from coming too far. And if you press down evenly, you can actually just stop the spread dead center. And you don't have to do anything at this point. You can just pick up where you left off whenever you're ready. Once you realize that you don't need your fingers to control the speed of that cascading motion that you could just press down on either ends of your ribbon spread, now you could go nuts. Now you could just lift it up and press those two ends like they're piano keys and just have that thing go back and forth. And if you can't leave well enough alone, what's to stop you from spreading in one direction and then dragging it back in the other direction? That's roughly even, but now the cards are doubled up, which means that you could press down on this side and just lift the whole thing up like it's a wall and then separate the wall and then collapse the wall and then pick up the whole wall with one hand. There's nothing saying that you have to move in any one direction when you do the spread. You could do it in an S shape and still do a cascade because nothing's stopping you from doing that. And because we live in an unpredictable world, there are zero things stopping me from adding a little peak in the middle of that ribbon spread and then stopping the turnover at that peak. And then whenever I'm ready, pushing that in, but not completing the turnover until I'm ready, at which point I press there and everything completes. Once you learn to play with the friction and the pressure, there are no more rules. All of this just takes time and practice. It seems a bit odd that the guy who had me and countless others chasing all these fancy flourishes at the table is a man who was very, very much not known for his fancy flourishes at the table. It was Jerry Andrews, the author of Card Control, still to this day one of the most respected manuscripts on that subject. 
Jerry passed away back in 2007, and at the time of his death was mainly known for two things, optical illusions and the work that he put into that manuscript. If you think about card control, the premise is to use moves and slides to get you to some particular end, and there's very little room for motions that do not add to that particular goal. So it seems a bit odd that a man who wrote one of the seminal works on that subject should, back in the 1970s, write a manuscript that had almost the exact opposite philosophy. That manuscript is Curious Cards. This book was written back in 1973, and the premise was that the whole world was chock full of pick a card tricks, and Andrus believed that there were things that you could do with a deck of cards that were curious and magical on their own. They didn't have to serve a particular purpose. It was also one of the first manuscripts to treat flourishing as an art form unto itself. So by my reckoning, this manuscript is actually one of the beginning works on what we now know as cardistry. Now, it's a little tough to get your hands on in physical form today, but you can still buy the PDF, and I'll put a link in the description below. Lest I leave you with nothing but card spreads and no way to use them, I'm going to point you in two directions. The first one is toward a guy named Daniel Prado, who created something called the Peregrine Pass. It's a way to do a pass while picking up a ribbon spread, and it is remarkable. I can't do it justice, so I'm going to point you toward him and that work to find out what it's all about. The other person that you need to find is a gentleman named Tom Gagnon. No one, and I do mean no one, has put in more work to finding ways to use the ribbon spread as a utility move than that man. So I'll put links to both of those gentlemen in the description below. And in the meantime, I'll see you guys soon.